the Lubrizol 360 Podcast, an inside look into the science of performance. Welcome to the Lubrizol 360 Podcast. My name is Andrew Markell. I'm the Director of Content for Babcox Media's Tech Group. Today, joining us from Lubrizol are Matt Gieselman and Martin Beers, and we're talking oil and oil certification. Martin, I got a question for you. Some technicians have noticed there's some change to the SN category. They're starting to see SN plus on some of the bottles. What does that mean? Good question. Uh, The OEMs that have moved to the turbo GDI engines have been experiencing problems in the field. We talked about LSPI. They have requested that the API issue a new supplement category to SN called SN plus and it is specifically designed to prevent low-speed pre-ignition. Yeah, so we we talked a little bit already about the transition from Generation 1, Dexos 1, to Generation 2, Dexos 1, and that incorporated um, an inclusion in the specification of an an LSPI engine dyno test uh, by GM to meet the new specification. that occurred in that transition kind of took place in the roughly 2016 time frame subsequent to that um kind of the same thing happened with the api service category donut logo they went from sn to sn plus and again that supplemental category was achieved through the inclusion of an lspi engine dyno test within within the uh, specification in this case, it was a Ford uh, engine test, um, a test that's known in the industry as the Sequence 9 test. Uh, that's not important. The, the important thing is it's a, a, a turbocharged GDI engine um, uh, that uh, the inclusion of which is meant to minimize the probability that you have low-speed pre-ignition caused by the lubricant. Is that the 3.5 V6? EcoBoost? It happens to be the 2-liter um, the four-cylinder, two-liter uh, EcoBoost engine. So, which is very similar to the General Motors two-liter turbocharged engine. It is. So the 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 GM test of LSPI and the Ford test of LSPI are both two-liter turbocharged engines. But they would apply for any turbocharged GDI engine. So yeah. you you could be as small as a 1.5 liter, as big as a 3.5. All of those would be susceptible to LSPI, and all of those would require SN plus to prevent that failure. So, if a customer uses an SN oil in an engine that required SN plus, what would be the consequences? Well, the the possibility is that that you could end up stranded on the side of the road with an engine that needs to be replaced. That that would be the extreme case of 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 what could happen. Um, using an SN plus oil or a Generation two Dexos one oil doesn't uh, doesn't make that probability zero, but it it lowers it a substantial amount. Okay. You know, you're talking like winning the Powerball type of probability um, that you're you're going to ha- experience a problem. Um, <clears throat> so you know, it, it's it, it is it is a a a, a, a real boon to you um, if you use and select the correct uh, category oil for any boosted GDI engine. Uh, made by any automaker. Yeah, we've, we've done some field testing. Actually, we've done a lot of field testing where the wrong oil was in the application and eventually led to low-speed pre-ignition. So it will happen. It's a matter of at what point in time or what mileage on your vehicle will, will this uh, failure occur. Yeah, I forgot about that, Martin. We, I mean, we, we actually did have, in one of our field trials, happened to be um, a GDI engine out in uh, Las Vegas, I believe, um, in a taxi service, stranded by the side of the road with an engine that needed to be replaced. We we have pictures of the pistons um, uh, back at the home office, and it's it's pretty catastrophic. The entire one face of the piston, both the first and second lands were completely broken off. And actually the, the scoring and the scarring went all the way down to the piston skirt, actually. So it was a pretty catastrophic event. Now, 
that particular um, automobile was running a lubricant that was generation one Dexos one. We had no such issues um, with a with the many vehicles that we had in that trial that were running generation two Dexos one. So that test really does make a difference. Um, so vehicles that don't require an SN plus, there's actually a benefit to running SN plus. Yeah, I mean, so SN plus, just like with any other service category um, uh, specification, is meant to be backward compatible. So if you if you have a, an automobile that was designed in the an engine platform that was designed in the API SN era, and you're now applying an SN plus oil to that to that engine, there's not going to be a problem. It's backward compatible. So you've got that technician on the fender again, looking down at that engine, and he sees a turbocharger and he sees a high pressure fuel pump on the valve cover of the vehicle. It could be Volkswagen, it could be Ford, it could be General Motors. Is there anything that he needs to be aware of? with the oil and the formulation and the longevity and hopefully keeping that customer on the road? Well, I mean, you, you need look no further than the, the owner's manual. The owner's manual will tell you which of, of, of these many specifications that we've talked about today, the owner's manual will tell you which one you need to meet and which one the hardware was designed to accept and also the viscosity grade. Um, as far as brand and all of those types of things, that's up to you. But you know if you see the logos that are the Starburst or the Donut or the Dexos One logo, etc., cetera, um, that it will meet a minimum performance standard that's appropriate for that bit of hardware. It's sort of another top tip. Make sure you're looking at your service information because inside the service information, there's TSBs for the oil, and there's also the recommendation for the oil grade and, spe and specification and viscosity in a Mitchell or an All Data or similar service information system that has been kept up over time. It's not stuck with the owner's manual that was thrown in the yes. glove box five, six, seven years ago. It was updated probably in the last three months, hopefully. Yes. Right. So the one thing that the OEM would do in the case of SN Plus they will send out to their customers an insert for their, uh, for their manual. So if now there's a change in what's required, the OEM, it's their obligation to send a notification out to everyone because they'll be all registered. And all they're asked to do is um, on page 67, here's your new insert. Please uh, apply it and follow the uh, recommendations. You see these brought up on some of the forums and guys discussing you know, which oil has the highest temperature for oil volatility. Does that play into carbon deposits inside the cylinder or on intake valves? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say I probably have imperfect knowledge there. I will say that these specs that I keep ta talking about, they have bench test requirements for, for volatility. Um, so basically you heat the lubricant up under really stressful conditions and see how much of it volatilizes out of the pot, basically. Um, and uh, Dexos 1 is a good example of, of a specification that has a relatively stringent volatility requirement. Um, so there is a measure of protection within, embedded within the spec itself against engine oil, excessive engine oil volatility. Um, as far as specific contributions of engine oil volatility to things like intake valve deposits, um, you know, it would be kind of gross speculation on my part. Perhaps that's the case. I can write a chemical mechanism where, where, where maybe that's true. Um, uh, but uh, so I'll say that's at the hypothesis stage at this point. Yeah, but so Matt, when you mentioned Dexo, so that is a perfect example that those formulations do use synthetic base oils. So it is a synthetic. They have a volatility requirement that's lower than the rest of the industry. But GM also includes a turbocharger test. So that's going to be a pretty good measure of volatility deposit control. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that, that particular test is a pretty hot test. Sort of an off-the-wall question from one of our readers. How does the color of the oil matter to the technician and the owner of the vehicle? 
Well, it depends on when you're analyzing that color. A, a fresh oil, uh, as long as it's clear, it's you're good to go. Um, some of them will have a more amber color or a more honey color. Um, you know, some some will have a little bit of uh, coloration uh, added by the oil marketer themselves. Um, as long as the oil is clear, it's uh, that, that's all you really need to worry about. You don't need to worry too much about the color. Now, an oil drain will almost always be black um, and opaque. Okay. Um, you actually want the end of life oil drain to look black and opaque. There are within the oil um, a bunch of different chemical additives um, that are meant to keep your engine clean. So, so anytime you have an internal combustion engine, there's uh, inevitably uh, some unburnt fuel uh, or I'll call them byproducts of incomplete combustion that make their way into the um, crankcase. And those byproducts of incomplete combustion can go on to form all sort forms of contaminants, and they have names, things like sludge, things like uh, soot, if you're talking about uh, certain types of engines, things like uh, nitrated organics, if you want to get a little bit another layer deeper technically. Um, but all of those things uh, turn into essentially dirt and deposit particles that will coat your engine. So if your oil is not black and opaque at the end of your oil drain interval, that means all of that stuff is coating the inside of your engine, and that's worst case scenario. The oil is meant to, it's formulated to suspend those things in the oil and carry them out of the crankcase when the oil is changed. So in other words, those chemicals are suspending one carbon molecule or piece of soot and another one and preventing them from combining together to form a larger particle that can form sludge and other harmful byproducts. Yes, that's exactly correct. So um, broadly speaking, uh, again, if we, if we want to use some technical words, a lot, a lot of the chemicals or additives that are present in a lubricating oil belong to a, a, a member of a class called surfactants. And surfactants are things um, like detergents or other molecules that are present in your oil called dispersants um, that do the exact thing that their name would imply. Um, they keep things clean or things dispersed or suspended within the bulk phase of the oil. And there's only so much of that in the oil and additive package, and this is why you need to change the oil? Exactly. So two things. First of all, as I said, the oil is a very complex chemical system within the crankcase. So there's all kinds of degrading um, chemical reactions that are going on all the time while the engine's operating. Um, and so those additives that are there to meant that are there meant to deal with those byproducts of incomplete combustion begin to degrade over time as well. Also, to begin with, they only have a certain load ca carrying capacity, figuratively speaking, for the amount of contaminant they can actually handle. Um, within the oil on a, on a percentage basis. So if you extend that oil drain interval out there too long and too much of those contaminants begin to form um, or the oil gets too stressed, um, that stuff, that black stuff that you see in your oil when you, when you drain it, drain it out the, the, the bottom of the sump will, will start to deposit itself all over the interior of your crankcase. That's also, don't forget, you have to change your oil filter because if you choose not to, to try and save a little bit of money, the filter will go into a bypass situation and no longer function. So you're changing your oil, change your oil filter as well. Yeah, it's cheap insurance. You guys work with the OEMs on oil. And what the OEMs do typically impacts the shop and what they have to stock for oil. Today and, and in the future, where do you see the shop in terms of having to stock different grades of oil, not just viscosity, but also different manufacturer specifications? Do you see that changing today or in, or in the near future? Good question. Um, the trend right now in North America is um, 530s and 520s still are a large part of the visc grades that are called for. 
zero 20s are increasing. So you're really looking at three viscosity grades moving into the future. Matt alluded earlier to some of the OEMs, the Japanese OEMs maybe are going to zero 16 and lighter. That's not going to be the bulk of the, of the volume that's out in the marketplace. So three vis grades moving forward in North America, having a ILSAC GF category and an API will in all likelihood cover 99% of the uh, requirements. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that or I'll amplify that, that that's true on, let's say, the five-year, five to seven-year time horizon. If you're talking about 10 years plus from now, you know, I, I think it's definitely possible that uh, – higher amounts of those thinner viscosity grades like 0W16 will start to, to penetrate uh, the North American market more. Because in terms of our shop owners and having to keep an inventory of oil, it seems to be becoming more and more difficult. Yeah, uh, probably the thing that may come into play here is the European car park is growing, uh, but while they're in warranty, they will be going back to the dealership for work. In the event that they're, they, they don't, then the, um, the service folks will have to have a European style oil. There are some brands out there that carry both the European, the ASEA, and the API slash ILSAC. Um, they are the synthetics, and they will be at this point kind of unique or exotic viscosity grades. So what do I mean by that? 5W40 is something that you'd see. But again, moving uh, in the next five years, the European OEMs are also moving to zero W, but the credentials that you're going to need are, are going to be different. Yeah, and, and so if, uh, if there is a, a feeling out there amongst shop op- owners that inventory is complex right now and maintaining an inventory is complex, I, I can't say anything that will offer you relief. Um, I think it will maintain its complexity as, as we sit here today and, and may get more complex as thinner viscosity grades, let's say in the 10-year time horizon out, start to penetrate at least this North American market in a big way. But even with ILSAC and API and ASEA being on two different sides of the ocean almost, they're still communicating and they're not going to introduce a really crazy grade of oil. No, uh, no, I, I don't think that would happen. They do communicate, you know, it's, it's a small community, so to speak. Um, we have, Martin and I have counterparts uh, over in Europe. The company we work for is, is a global company. So we have counterparts over in Europe that we talk to frequently um, that are part of all of those industry groups. Um, so, uh, and all of the peer companies um, that, that have, uh, participation in those industry groups are the same way. So I, I don't think anything crazy will happen. You know, you're not going to see a requirement for, hey, dump this 75W80 gear oil into your crankcase. Nothing crazy like that's going to happen. Um, but uh, uh, I can't offer you relief from a complexity standpoint with regards to the crankcase engine oil. At least we don't have to worry about Mazda rotary engines. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Martin. We've really set the bar here with these last two podcast episodes. I'm Andrew Markell. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Lubrizol 360 podcast. Visit LubrizolAdditives360.com to learn more.